I'm John DR with the Coquille Valley Swim Group, and today we're continuing our series on things you can look for in your solo training, in your solo kata, to uh, improve your work during this uh, sort of lockdown. Today we're going to be talking specifically about uh, looking at your tenuchi, uh, looking at how you grip the sword, and making sure that it's consistent all the way through. So, um, just a refresher, of course, in our style, we place the sword so that it is in line with the bones of the arm. We grip firmly with the bottom two fingers, middling with the middle finger, and lightly touching contact with the thumb and forefinger. The back of our hand, the uh, sort of U of the thumb centers on the blade, uh, rather than in some styles where it's canted off to the side. And, by and large, our hand remains soft, supple, and we don't really change hand positions. Um, however, <laughs> when people start working the kata, it's very common for this kind of thing to happen. They'll start off, very good position, you know, good tenochi, they'll begin their work, ba ba ba, first cut, very fine. After this first initial cut, when they begin to respond to Uchidachi, um, let's take uh, the movements in uh, uh, Nagashiuchi, for example. Right? So, in Nagashiuchi, I've gone to one side and cut, and now I'm moving to the other side to cut. Right? If I, sorry, that's wrong in the kata. We cut, they block, we pull back, and now we move off to this side as they cut to our head. So, as we begin to transition through here and grip, you'll often see the, the hand grip shift to something like this. Very 90 degree, uh, real close to the body, real, uh, even if they're, they're sort of reaching out to the head, uh, the whole grip sort of pulls in rip, and collapses in on itself like they're holding the hammer the wrong way, right? Instead of being that soft, lively, right, hand position. So, um, what are we looking for in terms of guidelines? Like, we've talked about the shape, and we've talked about liveliness, but does that just mean I can jiggle it? Because I can hold my hand rigid and still jiggle the sword just by virtue of having space at the top, right? But I don't have any life in the hand. So, uh, what we mean when we say life is uh, adaptability, right? But it's adaptability without a corruption to the fundamental position. In other words, uh, when I shift into Ukanagashi, by necessity, my hand pulls into this 90 degree position, or this 90 degree orientation that we just said was uh, no good, right? The difference is, uh, in this, I've come here not because I've gripped this down, but because the sword, which is normally here, has relaxed down into that open space, right? Into that same open space, you see? Right? Uh, as opposed to here, where it's held just by that, that collapse of muscle, that crush of muscle. Um, now, you might be thinking, okay, well that might be fine for a block where, you know, the force is coming down and you've sort of reached the end of that collapse. But what about when you're cutting? If you're cutting a dude like that, right? Wouldn't your sword push up also? Yeah, absolutely. And this is not necessarily a bad thing, right? If we're working cuts like um, any of the kiriyagis, uh, any of the, the cuts we're coming off, this collapse is desirable because it's going to accentuate the cutting motion of the sword as it travels through the person. Remember, 
uh, like, let's take the cutting the way we actually do ukanagashi, right? Ba, and cut up under their arm. This is not a block. We're not trying to stop their sword's downward motion with this position, especially with uh, one-handed work, because we're it's too much of a mechanical disadvantage, and uh, tactically it's it's unsound. If we go to stop their sword, boop, then they just slip and start working us uh, off our sword. So we would never <laughs> stop it. They're going to eat us. The way we've defended ourselves is by virtue of that tight sabaki, but by virtue of moving our body out of the way. In which case, this sword is just here in the path of their travel. We've just put it, boom, where they will encounter it. Now, of course, we're bringing it up with force, bam, and motion, bam, with the feeling of moving immediately to cut back down into it. But if they cut at us and we're very rigid here, like we're trying to support this, right, through tension here, like we're trying to stop their sword, like you see in like uh, Jodo work, which is different creature, right? We've got a long, long lever there. Uh, what'll happen is as I engage my muscles to support and stop that, I create uh, rigidness in my structure. So now this whole fifth structure becomes a lever against my uh, foot position, against my body weight. So as they begin to push whoop, with that tip, whoop, it starts to tip me centered on my lead leg. And this is very undesirable, right? Because as I go to step, it makes the motion eccentric on the outside. So I'm taking more time to make the step while not uh, allowing me to really sort of transposition my core, the part that's going to be like is in line with their hit uh, when they make their next attack. So, it's very bad, pop, 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 very slow. It's not real good. In contrast, with good Tenuchi, right? We hit this, and as that collapse happens, right? Now, not only do we have something that's not affecting our, our gross structure, but rather than the cut stopping in one place and only doing damage based on the force of their fall versus the resistance here. Now we incorporate that sliding, cutting off motion in which we're not trying to stop them. We're trying to let them go, right? We want them to continue so that the cut is more efficient, more effective. Now, in other styles and in, in times, uh, it is useful to forestall the enemy's motion. In other words, like if they're cutting, ah, to, to keep it from developing and germinating. And if we had uh, a sword with a wider grip, a longer ska, I mean, or obviously anything from Joe's size on Nagi Nagi Yari, uh, we could ax absolutely have the mechanical force to stop and suppress their work from underneath. But you have to remember that Hyoho is, uh, in terms of our physical sword work, a one-handed sword style. And so we just do not have the kind of uh, structural stability to stop somebody who wants to cut, who is cutting meaningfully, especially if they're wearing armor, right? They're just gonna bully right on through that and it's gonna break us apart, so it's no good, right? Um, another way uh, you can kind of think of and get a sense for whether or not your Tenochi is uh, close is, oh, sorry, spoon, how the sword feels when you cut. In other words, if you cut, And as you're cutting, 
you feel no discernible movement in the sword with relation to your hand, you're probably holding it too tightly, right? What uh, you will ideally feel is the impulse of the momentum pulling, uh, pulling on the flesh, right? Uh, it should not alter your position at all, right? If it alters your position, you're way, way too loose, right? But you should feel the weight of the sword uh, reaching out, being pulled out, right? Assuming you're cutting uh, in good method forward towards your opponent, right? If you're cutting down, uh, you won't really notice it because it's just uh, sort of locking up against your index finger and the heel of your palm, right? But to cut, boop, right opponent, boop, using your body, the sword, boop, boop, wants to go out. It's almost the feeling of uh, throwing uh, heavy knives, throwing short swords, right? Bah! And that same sort of tug, as though it's going to go off on its own. It's a uh, subtle, right? And when we're in the middle of kata, especially if we're turning our our intensity pants, right? And we want to just like, oh, I'm getting it, I'm getting it, I'm getting it, right? We can become exceptionally rigid through our structure, way more than we need to. And we can be fo so focused on the other guy that we're not paying attention to our own comportment, uh, our own way we're put together, right? With solo work, you should still train, of course, with intensity towards your imagined opponent, but it is uh, particularly your time to bring your focus more inward, and how does it feel? Where is my structure? How does this cut affect where the weight is on my feet, where my hips are pointed, how my elbow behaves, right? All of these are uh, important, right? They are the subtle differences that uh, either grant you, they, they grant virtue, right? Sometimes it's the virtue of time, because you're not moving excessively, right, through emotion, right? Sometimes it's the virtue of power and range in the form of tenuchi. Right? Where I'm getting the fullest reasonable length of my cut with the most amount of power. I'm not using my, the, the muscles in my hand and arm and my back to support the weight of the sword and just move it through space, right? So that the force that impacts them is very small. I'm letting the weight of the sword travel through them. So the impact is quite large. Um, I hope this makes sense. It's uh, it's really very simple. Feel it. Play around with it, right? And it is easy, especially in the beginning, uh, when you're studying this sort of lively grip, to, uh, of course, do it to extreme in either way, either. Yes, I've got my hand position, but it's really just, it's a rock that does not move, and we're just kind of rattling the sword in our hand as we work, right? It's no good, it's too tense, it doesn't transfer force well. Or, <laughs> that our hand is just sort of noodly, and if we hit anything, there's no, uh, there's no drive, right? Now, you might be thinking, but, with kiriyage, we want that, like absolutely, right? When we're cutting kiriyotoshi or kesugiri or, or any cut from up to down, most of the time, we're not just uh, taking kind of a free cut at something, right? We're not just hoping to hit something and leave them kind of unmoved, right? We want to hit them in a way that moves their body. This is still with a lively hand, 
And uh, this is uh, the tricky and hard part. And it's something that without a partner, you're not going to have success finding. Because um, you have to be able to experiment. You have to push on the person. You have to make slow cuts through the person's structure. Uh, slow thrusts, same way. So that you can learn in your body and for yourself that tension here does not equate to stability of structure. Right. But that, rather, uh, being able to maintain your structure is the result of several things from how you move your body, where your weight's placed on your feet, how um, the structure of your bones are aligned. Right. All of these things, the direction of the force. Right? They all come into play to develop a structure that's strong enough to uh, bully the opponent around, to move their body, to wrestle on their body one-handed. Easier, of course, with two. Uh, so, if you have a partner that's in your household, family member or whatever, go ahead and practice it. Um, Otherwise, just keep it in your mind that uh, just because it's lively um, doesn't mean you want to get pushed around uh, all the time, right? It's, it's probably clear as mud, but it covers the ground. Um, <laughs> as always, if you want to understand this work, you have to pick up a sword and go train.